if you have attended uh, my earlier meetups, uh, basically that's TBR training, uh, training from back of the room. We usually teach uh, how can you make these sessions more beneficial for learners. So that's why we put learners uh, first rather than presenters, because you come here, you put your uh, time to come and listen to somebody who is standing in here. So we put learners first. Uh, that's why we have the slides uh, in here, and which is basically, if you have been able to talk to each other, if you know already whom uh, you showed up in here, if not, then probably take this opportunity, introduce yourself to each other. If you have already introduced yourself on your table, try to find another person, introduce yourself, and also talk about what retrospective is. And once that is done, talk about what challenges have you faced so far in related to retrospective. So let's uh, spend uh, two or three minutes on this activity. And once we come back, we will reconvene and discuss uh, more related to those questions. <laughs> Oh, I have a bottle. Depending on how well your last two weeks went. all over the conference room, everybody is raising their hand. That means you're getting somebody's attention. So as a speaker, as a, if you want to utilize this as a facilitator, utilize that. Raise your hand that if one person sees my hand up, he or she will raise hand up, and then you will see chain reaction, and you will have attention real quick. Within two seconds, you will have that attention. So 
this is what it was. By the way, if you were wondering what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so let's move forward, and I hope everybody, uh, you guys have good discussion with, with what retrospective is and what challenges you have faced. So next slide is, let's talk about retrospectives. Can you turn your mic back on? Good? There you go. Okay. <laughs> How about whatever discussion you had on your table, if you do a little shout out, what retrospective is about? It's about uh, you know, what went well and what did, how can we improve? Okay. What else? And that's an interesting uh, point. Retrospective is about three things which we always talk about. One, what went well, what did not go well, and then what we can improve. Right. So, what else? What other thing do you guys discuss on your table? Things that can adapt. You need to have some action items of the perspective. So, so we we be effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Sure. How did we feel about the process? Right. 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 Uh, not just about the process, but about the people. Right. About what? How can you improve your interaction between the team members? Sure. What else? Right. Sure. Change the idea. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, review team norms and see if there needs to make any adjustments. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have one thing. Yeah, we talked about how they're just for the team. You don't want to have managers um, and other people trying to crowd in because it changes the venue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you see on the slide, it says. Uh, we, this is an event. Retrospective is just an event, right? Which which takes place after an inter iteration which gives you an opportunity, which gives your team an opportunity to talk about what they need to change to improve, right? So they basically go and examine, analyze, and identify what went well in their sprint. They can order them out and then pick one, whatever they think they need to improve, right? So if I say, if I can summarize all that in three things, <coughs> this is what your retrospective is. You have inspect, you have identify, and then you create. You inspect whatever went well in your last sprint. Then out of those, you identify which one are the big identifiers for your sprint. And then you try to put them in order. Once they are in order, they try to, you try to improve, or you try to create a plan, what I need to pick so that I can deliver more value to my customer or to my team. Any questions on that? Anything, anything other than this you guys discuss in, on your table? No. OK. So how many of us have been in retrospective? OK. How many of us have led the retrospectives? Perfect. How it feels being in retrospective or leading a retrospective? What are the challenges you have faced? Get sure. people engaged. Not to show your own bias, one way or the other. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I will. I will. As we move along, I will also try to tell you my story. I I, I started this journey ten years back, and I have been to so many retrospectives so far. And this will be my story too. And if you can relate with me, sure. Let me know that. Hey, you know what? I am on the same board which you have been few years back. So what are the challenges you have faced? Let's see. Uh, I will tell you mine first, which is disengaged. How many of us agreed with me? How about second one? Yes, no, maybe. OK. How about third one? Does that happen? <laughs> How about this one? Are they? How about this one? Yes? OK, now this is the big one. Wait for it. Oh, <laughs> happens? Oh, yeah. So in, in, in this session, we will be actually trying to understand why this happens. What is the basic reason behind that our team says, hey, no, I don't want to do. We don't want to do retrospective. Why? Because this is a waste of time. I'm not getting any value out of the retrospective. So in this session, we will discuss why that happens. 
there are basically few uh, what do you call root causes which if you want to drill down you can figure out why. So first one which I think is lack of focus because as a facilitator we are not able to bring focus to the team that hey this is what you need to do and this is you are not able to do that's why we need to come to our retrospective talk about it. Second which I think is lack of participation. We are not able to get engagement from the team. What do we need to do to get the participation from the team? Other one, genuine insight. Buy-in, we are not able to get buy-in from our developers or our team members. Bigger one, there is no follow through. After a retrospective when we decide that, hey, this is what the improvement which we need to do, but there is no follow up on that. We don't know, a team, team members doesn't know whether whatever we decided in the last retrospective, are we able to do it or not? Are we able to achieve on that? Where we stand, there is no follow up. That's why team feels disengaged. Team feels there is no value. It's just a waste of time for us. And then this guy. How many of us know what Pinky Brain is? What is it? Or what? Uh, Reticular activating system, what this is. All right, we, let, let's hear what that is. Anybody, you or you? So, the reticular activating system comes about like when you're thinking about buying a car and all of a sudden all you see is that model of car. <laughs> yes, that's a nice example. Uh, so, pinky brain, right? It's just the size of your pinky. And if you put your hand right behind your head, that's your pinky brain. And this is very small, but what, this does a very important function. What it does is try to minimize the function of your conscious brain. It tells your conscious brain that, hey, you know what? I got everything. You go take a hike, take a rest. I got everything control. So this brain will filter out all the routine work, whatever is happening, and it will give you a, a wake up your conscious brain only when there is a change. So your, your team is, if your team is connected, coming to retrospective every time and talking about what went well, what did not go well, what to improve with no follow up. This guy will uh, kick in and say, hey, it's a routine work. I'm not paying attention. You will get lack of participation. You have disengaged team members. So you have to make sure how can you keep this guy check. Pinky brain. Not, never let this guy kick in and say, hey, you know what, this is routine work. No. Take a hike, I got it. So how about, how, how many of us, you, you guys thinking that this guy, this guy is kicking in for you today, right in this session? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, well if at all, how about we do a little quick activity to keep this guy in check, right? So on your table you will see a mug, you will have uh, candies, some candies in there, and this is the activity which we will be doing. The activity name is Move Me Around, so this is the start point, if you can see. And I apologize, uh, folks who are joining us on the web, you guys will not be able to have fun, but you can actually see what's going on. So this is the start. We will start from one person. Pick one person who will be the start, and one person who will be at the end. And we will start moving one candy from start person to the end person. You can have only one candy in your play. That means if one candy is moving, you cannot start another one. So we're moving, are we moving it around the whole table? Yes. Ah. Right? So you'll start with the start, and then you will end at the end. And you cannot sure. passing it around. And it should pass from each table member. And then continue. And continue. Don't start right now. Wait for it. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's up to you. If you want to eat it, you can eat it. If not, then just keep count of it, how many you're moving. Right? So let's do a check for understanding. What you have to do, you have to move candy or you have to move yourself? Move candy. Move candy. How many candies you can have in play? One or two or three? One. One. Um, question. Does it have to complete the circle before we start the next one or can we start the next one as soon as the hand up? Yes, it has to stop at the end before you start the next one. Okay? So we will take one minute for this. And in the end, we will count how many candies you're able to move from start to end. Okay, so we're on okay? the mission to get the next one.
I will say, when I will say start, we will start and we will start at one, two, three, start. All right, uh, you have ten more seconds. Five, four, three, two, stop. Okay. So when we started this activity, first of all, we did not, uh, I did not ask how many candies you will be able to move, right? No. So, but think about this question because this question is very important. This will come uh, later in our session and we will fill in this column with that. But right now, let's see, starting from table one, let's say one, two, three, four, oh, there's no four, four, five, six, and seven. So how many you, you guys are able to move? 36. 36, wow. How many you have? 26. How many you guys have? 16. Okay. 17. 17. 26. 26. How many you guys have? 27. Okay. How about the last one? 10. 10. <laughs> Did anybody eat? <laughs> All right. Look at your numbers, right? And these numbers will come in picture uh, once we move to activity two. Sorry. Are we going to divide the number of M&Ms by the number of people at the table to get an average? Uh, yeah, like that's <laughs> that's oh, sorry. Sure. Um, <laughs> 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 okay. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Now, you know what? Thanks for asking that question. And before we move forward, I will take one minute and answer that question. I will be a little out of time, but I will answer that question. <laughs> in retrospective, you know, in retrospective, in my experience, this always comes. Team number one, team number two. These guys doing perfectly well. You guys not doing perfectly well. Why? Why what is the reason? Then everybody says, hey, I have only four members in my team. I come in here, hey, I have only one member in my team. Right? You cannot compare two teams. First of all, mm -hmm. you cannot. And I understand what you're saying. These numbers are just for the flag. And we will definitely talk about um, what these are for. But again, as far as Agile is concerned, we cannot compare two teams. It doesn't matter how many team members you have, whether you have one or two or three, or whether you have seven or eight or nine. Make sense? OK. Oh, I already explained this. OK. So in this session, we will be talking about three musketeers of retrospective. And uh, what if I tell you we already discussed three musketeers? What were those? Inspect, identify, and create. I will be lying. They are not. <laughs> OK. Moving forward, well, you know what? Let's go a little back. Um, so this is the title slide. In our TBR sessions, what we do is we put title slide in the middle after the activity. And at that time, we present or we introduce ourselves as a presenter because we want to connect our audience with the topic, which we did with our activity. You guys know what retrospective is. You guys already know what challenge you face in your retrospective. In this session, we will try to re uh, give you some options. How can you remove those challenges? And 
this is a title slide and then here comes my introduction in, well in, in the middle of the session uh, by the way my name is Avinash Avinash Tripathi um, I have worked as an agile coach uh, I have been working as an agile coach for almost six or seven years now um, I have been working with Capital One uh, Fannie Mae and all these organizations anything specific I'm just a regular guy who just go and try to transform companies and organizations and that's about it Anything specific you want to know, we will definitely catch up after the session. Sounds good? But before 8 o'clock. Yes, so before 8 o'clock. <laughs> Thanks, Brian, for mentioning that. Before 8 o'clock. I have a flight to catch um, at 10, so I'm just trying to wrap up everything bef before I, I leave. Anyways, so moving forward, let's see what this slide says. It says, five steps for a better retrospective. Now, if you have been working in Agile community, for one year, two year, you guys have come across one book which called Agile Retrospectives by Astra Derby and Dino Larson. And that book specifically talks about five steps to a better retrospe retrospective. And this is the book. We'll give away tonight. And yes, one lucky member will be getting that book. And we will be talking about this, this, this framework to run your retrospective. And then we will be building or our understanding what I think has improved my retrospective for my teams during the course of my uh, working with different companies. The very first one which says, uh, set the stage. Before starting your retrospective, what you do is, as a facilitator, you talk to your team, you set the stage, you say that, hey, this is the focus of your retrospective. We want to achieve this particular agenda, once this retrospective is done. How we do it? First of all, we start with establishing a focus. What we want to improve in our retrospective. We want to improve our continuous integration. We want to improve our team's velocity, the way we are working. Or we want to improve team communication. Or we want to improve something else related to people, related to processes related to automation. What you want to achieve after that retrospective. You set the stage. What else you can do to set the stage? What do you guys think? This is one more. Share the plan for your retrospective. How are you going to have that retrospective running? If you are doing any activity, if you are doing uh, any team building activity in your session, you share that plan with your team. You also share if you want to revisit your working agreements, if you want to change your stand-up time, if you want to change your uh, retrospective time, if you need to revisit your working agreements, you do that, set the stage. The other thing, the second step is gather the data. And we all know how important this is. Whenever you talk to the team, we say, hey, you know what? We did not deliver five user stories. Why we did not deliver? Where's the data? So this is a very important step when you talk to the team and say, hey, we need to gather the data. How you gather the data, that's a different thing. And we will talk about how can you improve your gather data process. You also create a shared pool of data to every, with everybody. The other way you can actually utilize this is ground the retrospective based on facts. My bad. I clicked the wrong button. Well, while you click on that, too, I'll even chime in just on the set stage thing, which is way I think, uh, successful for, for my side, is the working agreements you know, about when we meet and that stuff, but also what's more powerful to me is the fact that we agree that we're going to be very short to the point, or very, we keep it simple. Um, we stay present in our meetings, so we don't bring out our phones. Uh, we don't, so we want engagement, and, and that's the time to kind of go, hey, let's look at our agreements again. Are we still in agreement that this is what we think? If we do these things, we're gonna have successful meetings. That's a good time, I think, to do that. And not to then point at anybody that shows up late to something, but we all said we are gonna be punctual. Is that still something that we hold valuable as a team? And kind of keep everybody accountable, but just reflecting on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just the stand-up times, but what we as a team hold valuable together. 
Right. And uh, as I was saying, uh, the gather the data phase, you can also ground your retrospective based on facts, not opinion. Don't just get somebody's opinion because one person is loud in your team and he's just saying something and you base your uh, judgment based on that opinion. Don't, don't, don't try to do that. Try to have some facts from the team member and listen to everybody, not just one person. What the other thing is consider objectives, not subjective experiences. The third stage which we have is generate insight. Now, whatever data you have gathered in your step number two, you generate insight on it. Now, to give you an example, if you have 17, or maybe let's say, if you have 36 stories which you guys committed to deliver within a sprint, and you delivered only 26. Now, 10, not able to. So in generate insight, in gather data, you already gather the data that, hey, 10 stories, we're not able to. Generate insight will come in picture and say, hey, okay, why we are not able to? Let's talk about that. Is that something because user stories were not up to the mark, they were not complete because acceptance criteria were wrong or whatever it was. Your team will be able to let you know what that is. This is what generate insight uh, says. Understand systematic influences and root, cause, root causes. It's also talk about observed patterns. In your one retros first retrospective, if you felt something and if it was happening again and again, you have to observe for that pattern. Move beyond habitual thinking. Build shared awareness. Fourth step is decide what to do. The reason I'm skipping this because this is not what important is. You will already know what, about this from the book. So I'm just trying to skip on this. Uh, now, fourth step is decide what to do. Once you have generated insight, once you have gathered the data, you already know what you need to improve. Now, you have to actually order them. What is important? Now, think about what is important for team, not important for you, or not important for your organization. Because Agile is all about people. Agile is about team. You have to improve your team, and you have to uh, help them self-organize. So you have to think about what is important for the team, not for you as a scrum master, as a coach, or as a manager. Now, decide what to do also comes with move from discussion to action. You have already discussed in set the stage, gather the data, and generate insight. In this section, you go and actually go do action. You try to figure out what I need to do to actually able to figure out how can we improve our team. And decide what to do, you also agree on one or two improvements. You do not agree on 10 improvements. Not anybody can do that. You agree on only one or two improvements. Maximum two, at least one, but maximum two. Otherwise, you will not be able to Accomplish, and there is a famous saying, you try to catch two rabbits, you'll not be able to catch anyone, right? Any question? Okay. Yeah, uh, who owns the actions? What is that? Who typically owns the actions? Team. Not the scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and focus on what team can accomplish. As I already said, we focus on what team wants to achieve, not what you want to achieve as an organization. Sure. So can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, how, how would you handle this when uh, if this is a typical uh, that came up in, in my team's retrospectives? We're not getting what we expect from them. Um, either it's incomplete, they don't have the right people identified, uh, wrong time frame. They need to do better. They're holding us up. Mm -hmm. So now we, we've identified, we've got faulty work requests. Okay. What happens then? So uh, maybe I'll try to rephrase the question. You're asking is so we have one team, and our one team is not able to deliver because this team has a dependency on some other team. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah. So usually, uh, the way I will answer that, and Brian, uh, help me out in here. if. If at all you have any exa good example for these these folks, um, as a scrum master, it will be scrum master responsibility to figure out whatever happening in the team. First of all, these dependencies should have been 
sorted out before we started the sprint. Because when we say, hey, we have a user story, and before we start working on it, we have this dependency. Now, those agreements need to be finalized before we start. We have to talk to the other team that, hey, if at all you guys want us to deliver this user story, we need to sort this dependency out. Who has to sort to the other team? It's team's responsibility to make sure. Now, it's a Scrum Master's responsibility also to follow up on that dependency. You understand your point? Or maybe you and I can sync up after the session. Yeah, there's probably some contextual stuff that's important yeah, to yeah. understand. But yeah, I, I think Nash is given a good um, example there. Yeah, what I think of is like the definition already that you can establish as a team. Know that if you have a dependency, if they're not part of your strict planning meeting to understand what their capacity level is for that given team that you're dependent on, you shouldn't even take that story on because the team's not going to be available to work with you. Mm -hmm. And then there could be other organizational things that, yeah, the Scrum Master's got to jump in and raise it up a level and go, that team is context switch across the whole organization and not available to any one team like we need them. So we need to kind of take stuff off of that other team's plate. I mean, there's just all kinds of different nuances that can factor in. Yeah, that right. an offline is better. Cool. I'll, I'll shut up. Have a question? <laughs> oh, sure. How long? OK. So thanks for bringing it up. All the retrospective which we have done is basically time box, right? Everybody knows. Now, how that time box is uh, framed depending on how long your sprints are. Basically, for two weeks sprint, we try to fix in, in one hour. That's the time box. Now, if you have one month long uh, sprint or iteration, you try to have that for three hours or four hours, depending what you want to achieve. Now. How long you want to do it, you have to f have the, all these five steps within one hour for two week long iteration. As a Scrum Master, as a coach, you have to figure out these uh, facilitations for these steps. I guess the reason I asked, uh, some of the things you want to introduce to a team do not stick in the sprint. It could be a habit that takes time to be part of the team so after the first sprint. It's still going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. so Right, so that, that's where the facilitation techniques comes. And if you read that book, which Brian will actually give away, uh, it, it will actually tell you all the facilitation techniques. Last step is wrap up your retrospective. And this comes in picture when you try to tell your team that, hey, how are you going to follow through on what you actually agreed? Reiterate actions and follow up. Whatever you discuss in set the stage, gather data, generate insight, and decide what to do. When you have decided that this is the topic or this is the thing which you're going to take up for improvement, in wrap up retrospective, you will reiterate the actions. And you will also let them know that, hey, this is how we're going to follow up on this. So that everybody knows in the team that we actually improved something. If at all we did not, there will be a learning. When we go to next sprint's retrospective, we will talk about that learning. And as an Agile coach, as a Scrum Master, it is our responsibility to let the team know that failure is nothing. If at all you fail, that's OK. There are only two outcomes. If you succeed, that means you're able to achieve what you want to achieve. If you fail, that means you actually learn one way, which the way you don't have to approach your solution. Right? You have a remaining ways to. So don't let them be f afraid of failures. So try to tell them, hey, if we fail, that's OK. We'll actually learn something from that failure. In wrap-up retrospective, we also talk about appreciations. We let them know that, hey, we really appreciate your contributions. Thanks for bringing that topic up. We just, that, hey, say, we do not just go and say, hey, you know what? You came in here, you shared your vision, that's OK. Go, tada, bye-bye. No. We appreciate because they are they, they are coming there spending one hour for you to figure to figure out the improvement in their processes in their uh, contributions in their uh, way of talking to each other. So we actually thank them and we appreciate their time. What else we also do is identify ways to improve next retrospective. So what we do in here is we retrospect on our retrospective. If at all, some team member says, hey, no, I did not like it. I wasted my 30 minutes. Why? Because I already know all this. Why are we discussing it? 
So talk to them and figure out how can we improve or utilize that one hour they are sitting with you so that they can get value, more value, retrospective after retrospective. Anybody's pinky brain kicking in? <laughs> no? OK. So, so far um, in my career, I have actually faced little difficulty with two stages, which is set the stage and gather the data. And I, I always feel that when I tell team that, hey, this is what I want to achieve after the retrospective, and then team will say, yeah, I understand you want to achieve, but not we want to achieve. Right? You will hear that here and there. And then gather data. What we should gather? What value I will get if I gather this data? Velocity is one. Then we have commitment is another one. So you can measure so many things, but are, we, are you getting value after gathering that data or not? That is the biggest question which you will have to ask yourself. And then question comes, how? How I want to set this stage so that team will think that whatever I'm telling is for their benefit, not for my benefit. And if at all I'm gathering a data, what get data I need to gather? Whether it's a measurement of something or whether it's a metric. You will have that question coming around whether I'm measuring something or I'm creating a metric. I'm creating a metric for my team or I'm creating a metric for the management. You will always hear that question. So you ask your team members what you want as a measurement. Now, the three, um, three musketeers which we will talk about is basically on gather data. And we will also cover what measurement is and what metric is. So how about if I tell you this picture and let's see if you can identify the difference. Do you guys agree with this? OK, so let's try to put a perspective. Measurement is any data measured at one point of time. That means that shows a temperature of a room at one particular time. And you are measuring the same data over a course period, over a course of a period, and that giving you a metric. So you create a metric using measurements. Measurement is just a data set. Now, I will, I will try to put this picture, and I, I actually put this for my son. You, you take measurements, and you put them on y-axis and x-axis, right? So let's suppose you actually took all these measurements, right? There is nothing. My son will not be able to understand what this is. But as soon as you try to connect them, things will start to become clear. So when you put measurements all together on a paper, they will not make sense to you until you convert that to a metric. And it will show you a trend. It will show you how you can improve using your measurements. That is the basic difference between measurement and metric. Measurement itself will not help you. You will be able to compare two measurements side by side, but if you want to see the trend, you have to put them in a metric. OK. Pinky brain. Let's relax it a little bit. We'll do the same exercise again. But before we do that, we will hear the commitments. So considering your experience, what you achieved, what do you think how many you can how many gems or candies you can move this time? I see I see so many questions. Okay. That's good. So all you have to do, we will be doing the same thing. You have to move around candy from one person to another person, start person, end person, and we will be in the end we will be counting how many candies you are able to move. Everything is same, but we just need the commitment. What you guys think you can actually move based on your experience. So let's start with table number one. What do you guys think? All right, everybody. Everybody. Do I have attention? OK. Perfect. Let's hear the commitments from each table, right? Okay. 
Let's see, start with table number one. You're saying 36? 36, okay. How about, how about table number two? 30. How about table number three? 30. How about table number four? 50 or 15 or 50? 15. <laughs> how about table number? How about you guys? 55? 25. 25. How about you guys? 1300. Okay. <laughs> How about the last table? Table number seven. Guys, can I get a commitment from you guys? Huh? 20? Okay. Cool. Um, you have a question? No? Okay. So, we'll have one minute and we will do the same exercise. And when I say start, we will start. One, two, start. seconds. Three, two, one. Okay. All right, let's get the numbers. How about table number one? Okay. Anybody count it? How many? 34? Okay. I think it's 42. I don't know. 40. Anybody else count it? 3264. Forty-two. Forty-two. I'm I'm really interested in this data. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's try to put a little perspective on this. All the candies you have, small small candies, they are your user stories, right? If your user story slipped around from your hand, that means that was an impediment. And how you handle it, if you handle it pretty good, that means you resolve your impediment as a team, right? And I see you guys moving your cup, and thanks, Brian, for pointing that out. That means you had one epic, you're just moving around epic, you're not delivering anything. Okay. So now now we will understand what these numbers are, right? We finished our data gathering phase. The this is the data. And we will utilize this data to learn about um, three musketeers. The first one which we have is commitment reliability. 
and these are musketeers which help me improving my retrospective you guys when you go back you talk to your team talk to your team and figure out what will help your team to improve themselves these three musketeers will be different for you it's for me they are so we will we'll talk about that too number one is commitment reliability how you actually uh, figured out how reliable your team is you actually come uh, calculate the percentage of delivery versus commitment that means if we look at this it says table number one they committed for 36 and they delivered 40 you take a percentage of it and then you get to a commitment reliability now once we convert it to percentage you will get something using that number you can compare two teams but you cannot compare these numbers between two teams so uh, to answer that question which you asked first you cannot compare these two numbers because these numbers will be different from team to team but when you convert that to a percentage you will get the real value right and these are just numbers we are trying to put a perspective so that we can gather the data from team and actually we go back to them saying this is what your commitment reliability is sprint number one 80 percent sprint number two 90 percent sprint number four 70 percent commitment reliability dropped why it's dropped what was the reason that you're not able to meet your commitment when you put that perspective with the team team will start thinking their brain will start circling like, okay what happened in, in in the sprint why we were not able to meet our commitment now how you how you calculate it you calculate um, teams user story if team says that we will be able to deliver 10 user stories in your sprint and they're able to deliver five that means their commitment reliability is 50 percent we go to second sprint we calculate the same it's 60 percent it's improving if it is improving it's up to you whether you want to push them harder if it drops then it's your responsibility as a, as a scrum master or as a facilitator to let them know that your commitment reliability dropped and then talk to them how can you improve that commitment reliability that's that's number one point which everybody, every manager, or every uh, leadership in your organization will ask why this team is not able to deliver. And if team says this is because of the process, because of something some manager said or some manager did, or because your team, your team had a dependency on other team, then you can bring that up. Your team will bring that up in your retrospective because we had this dependency on other team. So all these things will come up using this metric. Any question? Uh, just a probably commentary or plus one on that is yeah the uh, I'm trying not to say the thing that I have seen a few times, but I'll, I'll get to that. But the um, when we can get the agile teams being very predictable to extent that seems you know not true, and that if you get 100% reliability right out of the gate for four sprints, five sprints, ten sprints in a row. Something smells, something should be smelling funny. <laughs> the team right. is like right. contractually obligated to only commit and they get paid for whatever they deliver. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's happening. Sure. The, but yeah, getting teams to be predictable in a way that, again, is within that 90%. Sometimes they'll do 110%, sometimes they'll do 90%. But as long as they get mm -hmm. into that sort of wiggle room, yeah, and then there's a invitation to, okay, how can we improve? Now that we're very stable, what are right. some areas to improve? Um, so yeah, I definitely like that. Mm -hmm. And when you start putting this commitment reliability on a graph, when you try to put a perspective on it, same way we created a cat using those measurements, you will see, for 100%, you will see a straight line. And if you're seeing that for four or five spins, that means they are trying to cook the data. Mm -hmm. That means as a, as a facilitator, you know something is going on. And it gives an opportunity for you to go in, dig deep, and figure out what's going on within the team. Why the commitment reliability is always 100%. But, We'll, we'll, we'll move on uh, with this. Any question on this, and we'll, we'll, or otherwise we'll go to the next one. No? Okay. Musketeer number two, velocity sustainability. And this helps team figure out whether they are able to sustain their velocity over sprint over sprint, and how we calculate that. So let's look at this data real quick. Table number one, they delivered 36 user stories in activity number one next sprint delivered delivered 40. 
Now you calculate the percentage, you will get the velocity sustainability. If it is 100%, that means they are able to. If it is more than that, that means they are improving. If it is less than that, that means team have. You have got two data points though. I would advocate that you get about six to eight before you start talking about sustainable velocity. Mm -hmm. Say that one more time. You've only got two data points. Mm -hmm. I would not call that velocity at all. I would say go for six to eight data points and then you can start talking about sustainability. Just saying that the, just having two data points yeah, it probably doesn't give you a very accurate reflection of what the team's consistent velocity is. So having six sprints in a row, then you've got a little bit more consistent number that you can right. you do that sustainability measure, right, William? Yeah, yeah. Two is way too early to do that. You're gonna get management will hop on you on the third one because all of a sudden things went south uh, and you team is still forming. Just so um, no, 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 no. That that's a good point. And maybe I was just trying to think, uh, how can I word it in a different way? Velocity sustainability, the way it is right now, it just tells you whether you are able to sustain your velocity, what you had in your last sprint. It's just telling you that. You are not comparing from your past um, sprints, right? And that will come in picture. That will be the third musketeer where we will calculate okay. actually that. And that will actually tell you the real sustainable velocity. Okay. okay. And how you calculate that? You calculate the percentage of two sprint velocity. That means if you have you delivered 36 in one and 14 in one, you calculate the percentage and you figure out whether you are able to uh, sustain your past sprint velocity. If it is dropping, dropping anywhere? No. So, we, sure. I think my problem with this. That's a measure of how many user stories you got done in that one sprint. Velocity is the average of several over a period of time of several sprints. Sure. So I think what's hanging me up a little bit is the word velocity. Okay. So who can answer this question? What is the difference between a velocity and number of user stories? Anybody? Sure. This stuff is all relative. I think musketeer number two is worried about sustainability, not so much velocity. You're just basing the sustainability on velocity in your mm -hmm. example. So to answer uh, your question, velocity is basically sum of all your story points. story points. So in here, the assumption is that all your user story are pointed at one. That means when you count the sum of all your commitments, which will be coming around 36. But that's not true. In, e in team's cases, right? Because our candies are same. So our assumption is that they are estimated at point number one. Good? Good job. And here I take care of your question, <coughs> which is backlog health. How you calculate backlog health is basically estimated backlog by average velocity. If you have only two sprints, and you know your velocity, you can calculate the average. And that is your average velocity. Backlog health gives you a number which will tell the team that, hey, I have three stories data or three, three, sto, sto, three sprints of work in my backlog. That means it will take three more sprints for me to finish everything, whatever I have to deliver to my customer. Mm -hmm. but, no, what is the head? Because that's, that's how you measure it, and that, that's perfectly fine. So you, at the end, you're getting the number of sprints ready for the team to take because they are already estimated. But what is the head one? Half a sprint, 50 sprints, five sprints? Mm -hmm. So backlog head basically tells you if your team has a healthy backlog. That means your team has something to deliver for a sprint or not, right? Yes, when so we what go to be the number. What would be the number? Mm -hmm. So if you calculate right here, you can calculate right in here. You have velocity of 36 plus 40. And then if we calculate average, that will be coming around 38 or something. And then 
it says estimated backlog. Mm -hmm. So in your backlog, if let's suppose you have 10 stories, and the sum of all the story points of those stories coming around 100, and you divide it by average velocity, you will get a number. Yes, but which one is helping? You, you always get the number. I have a, regardless what's the backlog, I can have the backlog estimated 5 points or 50 points or 500 <coughs> points. So mm -hmm. And my velocity is 10. So what I hear, I think what I hear you saying is that the backlog um, is going to, that calculation is going to vary depending on your velocity. So if your velocity average is quite low, yeah, we, and we, you have a very small estimated backlog, then that health might that health number might come out okay. Whereas if your average velocity is quite high, then your backlog might need to be a much higher number. That's, that's fine. How that, that's fine. So we know how to calculate it. But what, what it means that it's healthy? I have fifty bucks, let's say. Enough or not enough? So it's what what good. what this actually tells you and the number actually will give you how many more Prints your team will take to finish your backlog. So that's that number gives you. Yes, it's coming out only to a number. To your point, it's coming out only to a number. Yeah, but what, but what do you mean that it is healthy? Right. Like what should be the number? Oh, maybe okay. that's the question. What should be the number? I don't think it is. It, I don't think no, it is. Right, you're looking for the, <laughs> yeah, this absolutely. to tell you whether your backlog is healthy or not. Yeah. So what this is telling you is when you'll be completed with your backlog. What? So what okay. Does it care? No, I think I think I will I will take care of that question. The qu what you are asking is depending on your organization, how your organization define healthy. That's what I want. Right. In my uh, point of view, I would say if a team has this number coming up coming to be two, that means their backlog is healthy. That means they are not actually planning ahead more than two sprints. They are only planning for two sprints, and that's it. They are going to their grooming sessions. They are talking about stories, and they are regularly estimating those story, stories, and they are committing. They are pointing it out. And once you calculate this number, that means it comes to be two, it's healthy. If it is, comes to be one, it's not healthy. It depends how you, as an organization, define what it could be. And that will be the same for other uh, musketeers, too. It will be the same for velocity sustainability. It will be the same for commitment reliability, how you define because for some team, your commitment reliability come as 120%. Is that healthy for your team? No. Because they are delivering more than what they committed. That means some pressure is coming to them from management that, hey, deliver more stories. Why that is happening? So you need to talk about that. You need to define those control checks. Whether 20% is up, 20% down is your control, or for backlog health, if it is two, it is three, you have to define that. And it matters from team to team. Yeah, that's I, you. I think now got it. Uh, as far as like the graphical picture that I was putting up, this is like five. Like I've got a backlog estimated down, you know, deep. Well, however many stories, but I have 100 points worth of estimated work. Teams chunking away at 20 points per sprint. Five. That's typically yeah. I, I would agree. It's it, to me two to three is a good healthy backlog to where I'm not too far in front of the team, so I'm not having the team do all this work to estimate it when the priorities could change. So you've estimated all the stuff and now it's like, oh, users now want this. It's like, oh, throw all that stuff away or you know, reprioritize it down the backlog. So yeah, it's definitely organizationally, some organizations may want it to be at five so they can do big upfront planning and throw out a like six month you know, Gantt chart that says here's what we're gonna, the team's gonna do. It's like, okay, fine. But yeah, two to three is certainly where I would you know, wanna see this team. 60 points would be mm -hmm. good enough to just stay in front of them so that you've got good, Solid definition already, sort of sprintable stories, the development ready stories. So yeah, those are just grab cool. That's helpful. So, wait, wait, go ahead. I have a question on that. So, I have, I'm struggling with this whole idea that, that I don't know what my project is. So, um, how about if we take that offline? Is that okay? Cool. Your question, real quick. Okay, so, so I'm hearing this metric through the lens of an ongoing program. I, I am in an organization with a off-the-shelf product that has an indefinite life, so, uh, and I have in my backlog both product enhancements and I have bugs. And what I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing, and I'd like you to comment on or anyone else with some insight here, is that you're giving us a very high level picture of this backlog health metric. 
But if I wanted to, as a software organization, I could turn this into, well, I want to know my backlog health with regard to reporting bugs that are confirmed. And so what I might do in that case is I want to know what the health is there, so I want to take an average of how many bugs is my team actually correcting per sprint. And I'm going to use the denominator, not the total number of stories, but I'm just going to take the bug cases, mm -hmm. for example. So that there's really a lot of different things I can do with this statistic to measure my health mm -hmm. in a number of different ways. Right. And as I said, we started the session. These are my point of views, right. Right? right? And you can use these statistics to improve your teams right. in your organization in a totally different way. Right. It's, it's all about how you want to interpret that data and how you want to interpret the metric. You can definitely change this the way you work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, I'm not a developer. So when I look at backlog health bugs, I'm thinking, oh, that's 10 weeks worth of work. That's not even three months worth of work. As a line of sight in terms of resources and commitments and output, that's reasonable. It's actually kind of fast, right? Mm -hmm. So two weeks, is, is that um, really just to, um, to look at what this development team can can, uh, a backlog of uh, health of number of two, I'm sorry, is really the development team heads down focused on basically one month's worth of work at a time. That's it, right? But once you start to back off a little bit and you look at the project, the development, um, at, like the bigger uh, product or whatever it is you're developing, um, that's not unreasonable, I think. Mm, that is true. It, 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 right? I mean, as a company. Mm -hmm. development organization, you want to have a line of sight that's longer than a month. Right, right. Yeah. The, 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 the resources the, for... The right. other... Yes the other, and no. Yeah. Because you, right. you are talking about... For worker bees, for the developers. No, no I talk from leadership perspective. Okay. I don't want my people to waste time on something they might work three months from now mm -hmm. if next week I will change their right. priorities. Yes, but that's part of the grooming and the prioritization. Yes, so, okay. so we are talking about the... What, Whatever is estimated, it's what is groomed. Right. right. So you don't have to, you don't want to groom too much. It doesn't mean that you don't have a backlog. You have, you know, probably features for the next five years. Right. You don't have visions. Right. But right. you are not bothering people with thought right. thinking how to do it. Exactly. That's because I'm, they will not have exactly. time. I'm right. That, exactly. Right. Exactly. And just, you, I'm, I'm hearing that discussion, you know, the same kind of discussions will sprout in your retrospective right. if this number is high. <laughs> If this number is 10, the same thing will happen. One of the developer will say, hey, why am I spending time estimating a user story, which I need to deliver six months right. from today, and I know when it comes to delivery, things will change. I'm why as a developer? I think I am they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. These are not mutually exclusive perspectives. I think there's the part that you're focused on putting resources on, and then there's a part of the planning yeah. part. Planning and estimating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's cool. you know, one, one last so, bit to give you probably a takeaway that there are definitely techniques you can use that are lightweight that can estimate your backlog a little bit farther down the road, but looking at very coarse, like epic level sizing and say, you know, we've got 300 points worth of stuff to do in the next six months because we've looked at these six big epics right. and the team's been able to kind of size them. If that's important to you to know that, spend a little bit of time, but you don't have to spend weeks right. on it. You right. can spend an hour or two hours in a workshop and go, all right, cool, we got our estimate, move on. Right. You don't have them, they're not sprintable, right? You haven't broken them down and really groomed them, but right. there's lightweight techniques for solving that kind of thing, if that's not right. the case. So we will move, and as we know, this is the musket. <laughs> and the musketeer, sorry. the musketeer who's holding this musket is velocity sustainable thing. Right? And we talked about that. We have second must musket, and it is holded by commitment reliability. And we have third one, which is backlog health. And we have heard about star model of retrospective, right? You can utilize that with these musketeers. And in your retrospective, we can actually talk about what this team needs to start doing to improve what this team need to keep doing what they're doing to improve, <coughs> what they need to stop doing to improve. 
what they need to do more of, what they need to do less of. And in every retrospective, something shows up and says, hey, no, I don't think we have enough data to say this will improve. You can put that in parking lot and have discussion in your next retrospective, whether that is helping you or not. So in here, I conclude you have three musketeers to help your retrospective. You have velocity sustainability. You have commitment reliability. You have backlog help. You can use this data as your gather data, uh, the second stage for a better retrospective. You can gather this data. You can set the stage. What you want to improve? You want to improve your commitment reliability. You want to improve your velocity. Or you want to improve something else, not related to your musketeers. And then based on that, you already have a data. You can generate insight on how you need to improve, what you need to improve, why you need to improve. And then you can decide what actually you need to do based on this model. So in that case, I would say thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to me. And thanks for the invite, Brian. And thanks, Excella Consulting, for actually letting me speak in front of you. <laughs> thank you so much. Get out of here at eight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, for this, um, obviously, you spent an hour with us talking to us and you were some scrum background. For an organizational perspective, is this something you would do like, for individual retrospective to explain to people, yeah, we're going to do a little, little retrospective, but we're aiming at this sprint reliability, loss of sustainability, and backlog health? Is that something you would tell your team that can you kind of get your goals to orient to increasing all of these things? Mm -hmm. So as a facilitator, you actually working with the team all along the sprint, right? And you observe certain things. And in, in your retrospective, you go and tell, OK, if you want to improve, you already have some ideas because you are the facilitator. You put that up front with the team. And you set the stage. Now, you gather that information from the team, too, what actually they want to improve whether they want to improve their velocity, whether they want to improve their commitment, or they want to improve something else totally. So you do have to do that every retrospective, and you have to generate insight from the team and figure out what is important for them. So you can't let them off, don't let them off the hook by saying, hey, we'll make us happy, we'll have more beer at work. Well, how does that improve <laughs> these three things? I have a lunch <laughs> round, OK, we're not my yeah, philosophy. Yeah, yeah. I bet these things will come up. Yeah. The beer yeah. will come up. So Somebody will say, hey, no, I'm not happy. What do we need to do to be happy? We need, we need beer right next to my table, <laughs> or we need something else. We need more candy. We need breakfast every day. Things will come up. Less of Brian talking. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any other question I can answer? And I know we have to catch up two things, one and two. Or I already answered your question. I think we answered your question. <laughs> I think we answered that. Okay. I think we just we just need to catch up. Uh, we catch up. Perfect.